everybody, it's Terry, and welcome to this edition of the Book Report. I am so excited to have yet another amazing author guest with me today, and it is the delightful Cindy McChesney. Cindy, welcome! Thank you, Terry, for inviting me to join you today. I'm very excited to be talking about my book and projects as well. Yay! Uh, it, so, uh, quick question for you. Is this your first book with CNT? It is my very first book. Book number two is actually in the pipeline. So that'll be out sometime next year. Yay. And so we'll actually then plan on having you back before it hits the market so we can tell people all about it. That will be wonderful. Thank okay. you. So what is the title of the book that we're talking about today? The book is titled Fun with Panels, and it is not a project book. It is a process book, which means I'm going to walk you through the how to's, but not the specifics for creating any one specific quilt that you'll see in the book. That sounds absolutely incredible. It's been very well received. I think what happens is that people get excited when they go to the quilt shop and they see a cute panel or something there is sure is going to be great for their son-in-law or whoever and and they get that panel home and they you know they kind of start looking at it and they start measuring it and then they throw up their arms and go I don't know how to work with this and they fold it up and they put it away never to be seen again so yes yes that's why I wrote this book <laughs> that's brilliant now are you coming at this from uh, having worked in quilt shops or are you coming at this from being a quilter and going hey here's what you can do so I kind of come at it both ways I have okay. worked in quilt shops I am very definitely a quilter but I'm also a quilt teacher so what happens for me I think that my students over the years have gotten to know me very well through you know just locally and then through guilds and and some of the big national shows and they'll bring a problem to me and actually th this all came about because a shop owner said to me these panels are becoming very popular. I don't know what to do with them. How are we going to get people to purchase them? And can you please put together a class? So it started there and it just has uh, kind of snowballed as they say. Uh, I, you know, not for nothing. I uh, worked as a fabric rep for a couple, for a, a little over a year. And one of my favorite things to do in, in terms of like helping my shop sell panels was one block wonder yes uh, because they're like the the variety in that is incredibly infinite absolutely absolutely and they're beautiful and they're very addictive i've done one and then i just i sit on my hands now and go no you you have <laughs> other things to do so don't buy seven of those panels you're not allowed <laughs> well uh, I, we we can we can reframe that just slightly. You can do four panels or five four panels true, true. and do the four patch stacked posy. Yes, but no no. <laughs> I have other projects in the pipeline, so it's a it's a no I'm not allowed kind of thing right now. <laughs> okay, right now. Right now. Right now. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a favorite company that you like the panels or it just doesn't matter? It really doesn't matter. For me, what I'm looking for uh, is a great color palette, uh, a subject that entices me. No words. I don't like words on my panels, which isn't to okay. say that I don't create panel quilts with words, but I like to pick my own words. So I don't like a panel that's got a lot of words in it. It just kind of distracts, I think, a lot of times from the subject matter of the panel. I like you know, to see what elements from that panel I can work with. And I just find the words distracting. So it could be a panel that's just a solo panel, which is, you know, the one big picture kind of thing, like you would use in a one block wonder. Or it could be a panel that has multiple images that are the same size. It could be a panel that has multiple images that has a whole variety of sizes. Mm -hmm. I like them all. And so usually it'll be just something that sparks my interest. Or I might see a panel and say, I got to make a quilt from that panel for so-and-so. So, -and -so. so uh, when, you're, when you're working on these, are you um, 
as you're looking at the palette and then looking at the overall quilt, are you also looking for quilt blocks that might work well with that particular panel? Absolutely. I do a whole brainstorming process. So okay. what happens for me is I get the panel home. I wash my panels first because a lot of times the way they're wrapped on the bolt and as a fabric rep, you are aware of this, they get a little tweaked out of shape just from the way they're wrapped on the bolts. So I wash them first and then I just tack them up on my design wall. Okay. And next to them, I have a piece of paper. And it could take me anywhere from one afternoon to six weeks to get all the things that I want to do with that panel on the paper. I just do brainstorming. No idea is a bad idea. I don't throw out any ideas. I don't censor any ideas. If it's an idea that goes with that panel, I just write it down on that piece of paper. And as I'm writing, so for example, if I see something that has uh, little checkerboards in the panel, I might write down the word checkerboard, but then I might write underneath that nine patch, four patch, log cabin, anything that reminds me of a, a block that's made up of checkerboards, just so that I'm, I'm bringing it back always to the traditional quilt blocks that we're all very familiar with. Okay. And uh, what, what has been the most surprising Thing about doing these? So the most surprising thing, and this truly is the most surprising thing, when I was working on my first book, a very dear friend of mine said to me, I know that you are from Colorado because a lot of your panel quilts are very related to Western themes, uh, maybe the mountains or wildlife that you would find in the West or cowboys or horses or, you know, things like that. And she said to me, you know, you do have people who live on both coasts in this country. And I laughed and I said, well, yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> And started looking around and you know when you live in the Rocky Mountains, which I don't anymore, but I did at that time, you couldn't find a panel that wasn't related to cowboys or elk or mountains. So I went online and I searched a panel, found this really cute, very bright, colorful panel that related to, to being at the beach for the day. And I got that panel and it was sort of a very unexpected process happened where I actually created my very first montage, which is words, images, and generally you would say music, but I switched that to embellishment. And mm -hmm. I created a really fun quilt, which you'll find in Fun with Panels, called Beach Day. And it's so... Uh, full of all kinds of things, images, and so on and so forth, that most people don't even realize that there's a panel in there or that there are images from a panel in there. And I submitted it in 2022 just for uh, grins and giggles to the AQS Paducah show. It was juried into the show, it hung at the show, and even the judges, because I spoke with one of the judges after the show, didn't, they didn't realize it had started with a panel. So that's been the most surprising and fun thing that has come out of all of this. But the, uh, to me, as um, a quilter, that bespeaks the level of imagination that you can take with the panel and simply have fun. We're not locked into any one way of looking at these panels and using them. Correct. We can, so the looking, so you are looking at color, you're looking at design elements, you're looking at uh, what's the feel of the panel, and then maybe what, even what it's for, like if you're planning a baby quilt, the elements are going to take a baby quilt turn. Exactly. You might not want to do a lot of embellishment, if any, on a baby quilt, right. where if it's a wall hanging, then the sky's the limit. You can have a lot of fun. You could do some beading, some embroidery. You could pop on some charms or some yo-yos and really create a little art quilt from a panel. And 
it's surprising and really fun to see what students have done with these over the last year and a half, particularly. Uh -huh. uh, it's, it's been a blast. Once people really understand that there, the sky is the limit, there is basically no limit. So you can have a lot of fun if you just let go of all your preconceived notions of it's a panel, so I have to do slap on borders. No, you don't. <laughs> no. no, no, but but in that sometimes for something uh, like for something quick and dirty, like you need to get it out the door today. Slapping on borders is probably the best thing to do because it's, you know, sometimes sometimes quilts are a rush. Uh, you know, we need quilts in a hurry. Yes. And for charity quilts and those kinds of things, those are absolutely great. But I still encourage people maybe to throw in one surprise element. So maybe instead of just slap on borders, round and round and round we yeah. go, maybe in one corner, you do three quilt blocks that relate to something that's inside the panel. And it's now, it's got its own unique personality and something kind of fun and unexpected. So right and it also breaks up that solid border like what we can what we consider like just borders it gives right. it it gives it a lot more a lot more fun and and it and actually you know i love the idea of doing things with panels like that because it really does it can serve as a springboard into a whole other style of quilting for someone Yes, absolutely. And I think the other thing that uh, people always say to me after class is, oh my gosh, I never thought I could make a quilt without a pattern because they're creating their own pattern and they're learning how to graph blocks or how to size things or how to make that panel work, how to do a, a little bit of the math because there is math in quilting and especially in panel quilts. And, and that's to me very rewarding when someone says, I never thought that I could make a quilt that was my idea that didn't come from a pattern. And that's exciting. As a fellow teacher, I completely agree with you there there's that's for me that's almost the Russian quilting yes. that like somebody gets so excited that they see it's not just the one possibility but the many possibilities and that they that they can take their own unique spin on anything and create something even out of something that it seems very specific, they can create something unexpected. Exactly, and, and I love the unexpected. It's, and when students send pictures, I'm always, my mouth usually just drops to the floor, I'm like what a cool idea that was, you know? <laughs> How fun is that? So yeah. I do love, do you have any specific thread that you're using when you're piecing your pan you're working do you have needles you know that what are what are the tools of your trade besides your paper and pen yeah so my go-to tools i a couple of things i want to say about that actually my my go-to thread is the orafil i like okay. the 50, 50 weight two ply thread um i haven't tried anything thinner yet but i do like that orafil i use quilter's dream batting Okay. Yeah, cotton select batting when I'm long arming my pieces. Uh, but here's the thing. People forget that they know a lot. Unless you're a rank beginner, you know a lot. And so I try to encourage people to use what you know. If you want half square triangles, don't think you know, I got to cut out two triangles and what size would they be? What other tools have you used to create half half square triangles so use what you know you know to make those things work and uh, i think if people could use the tools that they already have because they've taken people take hundreds of classes right i watch i've watched people during the pandemic in particular you know the only way to do anything was to do it online and so people were taking all kinds of crazy classes and i've had some fun quilts come out of the panel class where someone said well 
I took a class on a ribbon border and I think that would work with this panel. And so then they got to use what they had learned somewhere else and incorporate it into a unique piece. Or I learned how to do this. I wonder if I could incorporate that into my panel quilt. So use what you know, because you have a lot of tools that you probably maybe learned something about and couldn't quite figure out where you were going to you know, maybe you didn't want a whole quilt with a ribbon border thing going around it, but one little part of a, of a panel quilt is a perfect way to use that skill and enhance that panel. And it reinforces the creativity on one side, but also helps you hone that skill set for piecing your half square or quarter square triangles or your drunkard's path to create whatever your visual is. Absolutely. And I love that because I think uh, we forget sometimes that we, we do know a lot. Right. We have a lot of tools at our disposal and we just forget that we have that stuff and mm -hmm. we start to get a little overwhelmed per se or, you know, not sure how to do something. And it's just like, stop, take a deep breath and use mm -hmm. what you know, because you have, you, you do know you have those tools. You've taken that class or, you know, learned that skill. Do you have a tip for squaring your panels? I know you, you put, I know you put them on your design wall, but do you have a tip for squaring them so they're not quite so wonky? Yes, I have a couple of tips. So it depends on the type of panel. Okay. Let's start with the big solo panels because I think those are the trickiest ones to get square. And those I really do think you have to wash because those when they get wrapped on a bolt and they go out of whack, they go out of whack. So you've got to get those washed. That will solve probably about 80% of the problem you're going to run into. Okay. But then the other thing that I will do with those types of panels, I will block them just like I block a quilt. Okay. And I can do those big panels either on the floor or on my design wall, however you like to block your bigger pieces, but just block it like a regular quilt. Now, if it's pieces or segments or images of a panel, I will cut those out, you know, with as much space around if there is space around them to be had, you know, some of them have the images where they just are right up next to each other. Right. In that case, I cut on the very delineated line. And if the piece is a trapezoid, when I get done cutting, I don't freak out about it. I use a little bit of a spray water, and then I will use a uh, my iron and literally kind of force it, but just a little bit at a time, right. continually checking with a square ruler until I really get it right where I want it. Once I have it in the position I want it to be, I'll spritz with a little spray starch and then press this way, not this way, but right. uh, you know, and then I'll lay a great big ruler on top of it and stack some books on it and just let it dry. And then it's good. It's golden. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> right. Right. Do you have any favorite rulers, uh, favorite rotary cutters, favorite scissors? I do love the Deb Tucker 180 design rulers. Mm -hmm. I, I can't live without my, uh, my Tucker trimmer one for my half square triangles and her wing clipper for my flying geese and several of her other uh, rulers for just basic units. I, mm -hmm. I love her rulers for that. And I do uh, love my uh, Alex Anderson's, uh, what do they call those? I have one here. Oh, Quilter Select with the, not the grippy backs for yeah. strips and, and squares and that kind of thing. I, I, those rulers are a godsend, especially as you get older, the hands get a little more tired. And so having those are, are great. And that, those are probably my favorite tools. Uh, the, those are, that has been uh, for me as a quilter, uh, as much piecing as I actually do, those, ha those rulers have been a true, um, a great addition to my quilting room because with the cutting mat, I can just turn things very simply. I'm not having to work too hard. I'm not gonna have to reset the ruler. It's just turning and turn and cut. Yeah. Um, and I love the weight of that ruler. Mm -hmm. And as uh, for me, I'm, I'm also slightly ambidextrous and I've learned how to teach my students how to use the rotary cutter with their left hand. So now I have a rotary cutter that I just move over and, and show them how to use their rotary cutters left-handed because, you know, our left-handed friends need, they need that same kind of, they yes. need that same kind of visual. Yes, they do. 
<laughs> and I think quilters in general tend to be extremely visual. So, I mean, I know for, for me, if I can't see it and you start talking to me about it, you're going to lose me about two sentences in. I'm going to be going, I don't know what she's talking about. Uh, you know, I can, I had a meeting yesterday with someone and I said, can you just show me? Cause I don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> and it should have been something fairly simple, but I'm so visual. I have to see it. So I get that. And, and, uh, what um, you probably, you probably understand this having worked in quilt shops with quilters sometimes we need to come up with answers on the fly to help them see what we're doing yes and, and so other descriptive words or actually going to whatever place and showing them what we're talking about uh, e even as much as you know just adjusting or i like i when i'm sitting at my machine piecing or quilting i sit just to uh, the right of my machine so that I can visualize where that quarter of an inch seam is, even though like right in front of me, I can see it, but making sure that my fabric's not on the right side, this way I can see it. So actually showing them how I'm positioning my body actually does make a, a big difference in, in all of that. So yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I think sometimes you're put in a situation as a teacher where you might explain something two or three times and you're still getting that deer in the headlights or I have no idea what you're talking about look which thank god we don't have masks anymore because that was really hard to see when everyone was wearing a mask but uh you know you that's when you as a teacher that's your skill as a teacher I got to come up with another way to explain this so that this person understands what I'm saying right I think I'm pretty good at that I I hope I am <laughs> You know, one, one of the things that I've discovered is sometimes I'm really good at it and other days yeah. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally got nothing. Um, do you, uh, when, with your iron, um, I, I changed something with my iron a few years ago, but with your iron, are you setting it on really high heat or are you setting it on a more moderate heat? I use a more moderate heat. And okay. I think I was, I'm like you, I used to have it on the highest setting that it would go to. And I also used to put water in my irons and use a lot of steam, but I've really stepped away from that in the last few years. I use a spray bottle now and I'm probably down at the very lowest cotton setting. Yeah, that's about where I am. Yeah, and that seems to work just fine. But one of the things I, you talk, you teach process, I teach process. And part of, part of that is, and, and this is, this is really, this is really challenging because sometimes we just want things done right now. Mm -hmm. Slowing down actually permits you to be more accurate, even with the pressing and the ironing. Slow down. Yes, I, I think we had a period for a number of years, uh, I noticed where, and I think it's still there, uh, but there was a period of time where it was how fast can I make how many quilts, you know, can I make a hundred quilts this month? Or I, you know, I know that's an exaggeration, but it was like, everything was a shortcut and a fast mm -hmm. um, and things were not very accurate. As a long armor that, you know, I, that really became evident when, when people would bring in quilts and I would know exactly what technique they had used or what video they had watched or whatever, because the blocks were all different sizes, the quilt wasn't square, so on and so forth. So I, I'm with you. I think just slow down and go for a little bit more accuracy. Um, you know, if you don't care and it's a charity quilt and or it's going to be, you know, thrown on the back seat of the pickup truck for your dogs to sleep in, that's fine. But if it's something that you're going to give as a gift or you want to be a little bit proud of, just slow down and just mm -hmm. take the time to be a little more accurate. In the end, I think you'll enjoy the, the fruits of your labor a lot more. And, and for beginners, learning how to slow down gives them the space to learn. I agree. It, right. Um, and, and, and to control what's happening underneath the needle. Um, and, and I imagine that with the panel quilts, this actually does make a big difference because you're, there are times when I, 
I can see where you'll be working with bias and you want to be careful yes. with that. Yes. And if, you know, let's face it, we'd like to think they're printed on the straight of grain, but they're not. <laughs> so, so the reality is probably almost all of your panel pieces are on some kind of a bias. Right. You do want to take your time, be slow. And it's where that's where that spray starch really does come in handy when you've got your piece blocked or you have pressed it into the right shape. You want to take the time to to let it dry with that spray starch on it that's what i tell people okay you've got that squared up go make those half square triangles while you're waiting for that to cool off <laughs> right right and and you know that kind of planning for your project takes practice it's like any other part in quilting it just it takes time to get into the rhythm of doing other things while something else is happening do you have a favorite iron I don't actually, okay. I, I don't have one of those big expensive irons. Uh, I, <laughs> the jury's out on that for me. I have friends that have had them and they don't la seem to last any longer than the $12 iron I picked up at Walmart. So I don't, <laughs> I don't have a favorite. <laughs> Sorry, iron people. <laughs> but they're okay, they understand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They understand. I, I I do I I do have a couple of favorite irons, uh, partly because they're cute, and that's all I'll say about that right now. So when you're um when you're stitching or when you're quilting, um, what are you listening to in the background? Or do you, you know, have anything on in the background? I actually, if I if I have anything on, it might be a little bit of TV, but it's usually pretty low. It could be, you know, anything from Hallmark movies to uh, HGTV. I mean, I'm not really listening. It's just kind of a buzz in the background. If I have anything, I do work a lot in silence. Okay. And I think I work in, I don't, I'm not a music person. Uh, which is crazy because my degree from college, I'm a, mu I'm a musician, <laughs> but I don't have music in the background. And I think for me that the reason I don't have music in the background is it's as a musician, it's distracting. I okay. hear a line or I hear something and go, oh, that's a great trumpet solo. And it's like, wait a minute, I just sewed right off the side of whatever I'm sewing on. You know, I can't, I can't listen to music and just let it be in the background unless it's like the spa music. Okay. Find you music you'd listen to when you were meditating or you were going to get a massage or something. I, that sometimes I can put on, but generally I just work in quiet. Okay. Like uh, what do you drink in the sewing room? I'm a water person. I, I don't drink, I really don't drink a lot of different beverages to begin with. I'll drink hot tea, iced tea, water, and occasionally a smoothie, but I'm not a soda person and I'm clumsy. So water is <laughs> safe. <laughs> water is safe. <laughs> yes, you're not going to, you're not going to accidentally stain something with red wine. <laughs> no. <laughs> And I'm not a wine drinker anyway, but you keep that under your wraps because I used to work in a winery and, but I don't drink wine. I won't tell anybody if you don't. <laughs> no, because you don't want all those people to know when I was tasting wine with them and telling them how fabulous the wine was and what they were sniffing and what they were tasting that I wasn't drinking it. So really, I was just making it all up. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I I actually, you know, I actually kind of I actually kind of get it because you with um with we taste with our nose we taste with our nose first so yeah I, I kind of get that um when so uh I, I love when this happens like creative brain is going I have nine questions um when you're um uh when you're quilting when you're actually doing the quilting process are you doing pantos are you doing um like how how do you approach the quilting on it the the holding the layers together it, that's a great question and it really again depends on the quilt just okay. like or the customer you know sometimes the customer okay. wants to have a panto and that's fine uh if a 
if a quilt is exceptionally busy, I will recommend a panto because it doesn't matter how much custom quilting you're going to do on that busy quilt. No one's going to see it anyway. Right. So you might as well just, you know, put it together and make it pretty, but make the quilting match a theme in the fabric or a theme of the quilt or whatever. But I do like to do, I like to play around. So I kind of mix patterns. I'll take elements out of patterns and combine them with other patterns. I like to do, you know, border designs or, you know, block designs. It just sort of, I, that unfolds almost like making a panel quilt for me. Okay. It's like I get it on the machine and it's kind of like, okay, what do I think I would like to quilt here? And I, you know, kind of study the block or the area of the quilt and, and work it that way. You know, pantos have their place though. I mean, there's obviously some quilts you just absolutely do not want to spend the time or whatever with a, a custom design. Mm -hmm. I don't do a lot of outline quilting. I don't do a lot of texture quilting. Those are not my fortes. So I, I stay away from that, but uh, I have a lot of fun and, and try to make it interesting. And what are you sewing and quilting on? I work on a Gamel Statler. Okay. Yep. And, and for your piecing? I work on a Bernina and I think I'm due for a new one because this one's getting ancient and I love it, but it's a, it's a, it's a 440, the Aurora 440 from, oh my gosh, 12 years ago, or maybe a little bit older. I but think it might be still, a bit older. Yeah, probably. It's still ticking. It still goes along great. So, you know, knock on wood, don't, don't fix it if it's not broken kind <laughs> of deal. <laughs> But I think uh, sometime, hopefully in the next year, I'd, I actually would like to treat myself to a new, new Bernina. And, and what would you be, what would you be looking at? Oh, I don't need the embroidery. I actually don't even need the big throat for quilting because I don't quilt on my domestic machine. Mm -hmm. I just need a good workhorse like this one that I have now, just maybe a little more, you know, less chance of like my car breaking down and not coming back to life. <laughs> What happened to your car? Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's just oh. getting up there in years, too. And I'm thinking, well, I really didn't want to have to buy another car in this lifetime, but this isn't going to go forever. So I've got to start thinking about it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. No, they don't last quite the way they used to. No. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Um, and where are we? Where can we find you? Where are you teaching? So right now I just have a number of guild events coming up. Okay. I may be, uh, where am I going to be? I'm going to be in Omaha, Nebraska in August. Okay. Be in Georgetown, Texas in October. You are? Yes. When? Uh, October 3rd and 4th. Okay. Uh, the 4th and 5th, <laughs> something like that. Um, yeah, they must be the 3rd and 4th. Uh, okay. There's a guild there, and I don't know the name of it off the top of my head, but I can uh, let it's you probably know. My, it's probably a, lo a guild local to me because I live in Georgetown. Well, it's got to be local to you then. Yeah, so I'm yeah. there. And then uh, the fun, some of the fun things coming up in 24 is I'm leading a quilting tour to the Netherlands and Belgium through opulent quilt journeys. So okay. uh, we're, I'm excited, excited. That trip was supposed to go this year and it didn't happen. Okay. And I think people were still kind of recovering from the pandemic and not, an, you know, a lot of people weren't traveling quite yet, but I think I'm hoping that next year it is really going to be a go because it is going to be a blast. We're going to be doing all the th touristy things plus then all the quilty things. So the and there's chocolate. There is chocolate because we're ending up in uh, Belgium. So yeah. it's, yeah, the Netherlands and Belgium, and there's, yeah, there's definitely chocolate. There's, <laughs> yeah, quilters and chocolate sort of go hand in hand. It kind of goes together, yeah, so that's one of the biggies next year. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the things that are coming up anyway, and uh, there's more, but that's what I can think of off the top of my head, so. That's, that's amazing. Now, will you be at a uh, quilt market this year? No, I'm not going to be there this year. I was there last year and this year just didn't quite work out with my schedule. So I'm not going to make it this year. I might make it to spring market. We'll see how things go. Okay. All yeah. right. Um, any final words? Uh, just get a panel and, and, and take a look at my book and read the book. That's one of those funny things, you know, people go, don't, I, don't you do that? I do that. I get a quilt book and I go through and I look at all the pictures and then I go back and maybe I'll read, you know, 
cover to cover, but it's well worth the read. I've had a lot of people tell me it was totally worth the read. But if you'll read the book, I think you will probably get most every question you have about how to work with panels mm -hmm. answered. And then there's a lot of great ideas in there for projects, everything from, you know, tote bags to placemats to quilts to table runners, all kinds of ideas in there. So wall hangings, you name it. And I, and I work with every kind of panel in the book. So I think it'll, you know, people will find it a little bit inspiring and a lot answering, answering lots of questions. We, we love answering questions. I mean, that's, that's partly what we do. We do as teachers is we answer lots of questions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon on the book report. Yeah. And I look forward to getting this out there to our readers and for them to get your book. Um, can they buy the book on your website? They can order it on my website, which at the moment is for some reason floating around in whatever that space is where websites go that aren't actually showing up on the internet. That happened this morning. I was checking today and they've assured me it will be back in place in 72 hours, <laughs> but it's uh, it's cedarridgequilting.com. Okay. So hopefully they can find me there <laughs> and you can always get the book on Amazon or go to your local quilt shop. That's the thing I like to encourage people. Please go support your local quilt shop. If they don't have the book, they can order it for you. So uh, they can order it in for you or you can order it from me. I'm happy to send you an autographed copy. So yes, fun with panels. Fun with panels. All right. Thank you again, Cindy. It has just been a delight talking to you and I will see you the next time on the book report.